Londonderry last month. The funeral of Patsy O'Hara, the fourth Republican to die in the May's prison hunger strike. Tonight, World in Action looks at the propaganda war in Northern Ireland. A war fought for press headlines and TV coverage, where reporters and cameras can easily become unwitting allies of the propagandists. We've tried to avoid that, but the only sure way of avoiding it would be to not report from Northern Ireland at all. Ulster's mood has been transformed by the deaths of four hunger strikers, which have unleashed more violence, 22 deaths in three weeks. And the local elections show that Protestant and Catholic are polarised as never before. With the military campaign stalemated, the IRA prisoners were looking for a way to rebuild their flagging popular support. Catholics in the hardline Republican areas leave no doubt that the IRA's new tactic has got through to them. Since the first hunger striker died, anti-British riots have again become a daily fact of life. Then there are the peaceful protests, which blur the distinction between sympathy for the hunger strikers and support for the paramilitary organisations they represent. Among the organisers, Sinn Féin, a legal political party which openly supports the aims of the IRA. Sinn Féin spokesman, Joe Austin. We seek people who support the political status campaign. We don't ask them as part of a precondition that they have to our, accept our politics or we theirs. And while people support the campaign for status, we welcome that support. That is the area, and that's the key area for both ourselves and for the British. Because based upon their reaction to events, uh, our campaign succeeds or fails. Joe Austin speaks for Sinn Féin, and everyone in Northern Ireland knows that Sinn Féin speaks for the IRA. The IRA are not exploiting the Hitchblock situation as such. What they are exploiting is the British government's blunders over the Hitchblock. We're involved in a very deadly political game, if you like. The h block protest began five years ago. Till then, men convicted of terrorism had political prisoner status. That meant special privileges. About 150 men convicted before 1976 still have that special status today. But in 1976, the Labour government withdrew it for all new prisoners. Now the IRA and its supporters want those privileges for all their men inside the maze. According to the IRA, the issue is prison conditions. But if the maze is as their propaganda paints it, the physical conditions are self-inflicted. In a protest now abandoned, prisoners smeared their cells with their own excrement and refused to wear prison clothes. We're political prisoners! We want political status! We're political In 1980, the European Commission on Human Rights looked into the prisoners' complaints and recommended against giving them political status. So now the IRA tells the world that all they want are five demands the right to wear their own clothes, no penal work, free association with each other, educational facilities, and the restoration of remission lost through breaking prison rules. Belfast MP Jerry Fitt says that is not what it's really about. No, no, the issue is about the legitimacy of paramilitaries and in particular the IRA. <coughs> the five demands include the wearing of their own clothes, free association, and no work. In other words, they want to run the prison on their terms. Now you can't grant political status to only the IRA, you must grant it to every other loyalist murderer or potential murderer. And if in fact you are going to legitimise the actions that they are already in prison for, you are giving a very clear signal to someone who as yet has not committed a murder, but you are saying if you kill a policeman next week, if you kill a soldier next week, if you murder a Catholic uh, next week, provided you claim to be pol politically motivated, you will get privileged treatment. The British government answered the IRA's claim in a pamphlet issued by the Northern Ireland office. This claim Republican prisoners could have the best conditions the prison service can offer if they abandoned the protest and the demand for special category status. Northern Ireland office minister in charge of prisons, Michael Allison. They would be able to wear uh, civilian-style clothing issued free to them by the prison authorities. After five o'clock every weekday evening, they would be able to change into clothes sent in to them by their families, anything they wanted to wear, 
and they would be able to wear those throughout the whole of the weekend. Again, from five o'clock onwards, uh, every day, they would have free association, freedom to talk and meet and read papers, watch the television, play sports and so on. Throughout the whole of the weekend, they would be able to receive a good many visits and so on. The first hunger strike campaign began in October last year, when six Republican prisoners refused food. But in December, they called it off, claiming the government had made major concessions. Then, in circumstances now hotly disputed, the understanding which ended the first hunger strike collapsed. A second strike was threatened by the IRA's leader inside the maze, Bobby Sands. The prisoner's version of what went wrong is given by Father Dennis Fall, a Catholic priest who regularly visits Republicans in the maze. After Christmas, the government and the Northern Ireland office and the staff and all took a very hard line and Mr Sands was compelled to uh, break off negotiations. He did make a number of attempts. For example, he got 20 men to come off the dirt strike, the no wash strike, and to wash. But the prison officer somehow or other managed to take two days to wash 20 men. This was clearly a frustrating atmosphere. Some say they didn't want to lose their bonuses, but there certainly was a lack of cooperation with Mr Sands that frustrated him and drove him to take up a, another hunger strike. From the Northern Ireland office, there's a different story that all the government had done was to show the prisoners the new rules laid down in its booklet, day-to-day -day life in Northern Ireland prisons, which had relaxed clothing regulations for all prisoners. The government says that when the IRA men realised that this didn't give them the freedom to organise their men inside the prisons, they decided to step up the propaganda war. The objective that the, that the uh, provisional IRA were seeking through, for example, the uh, the long drawn out dirty protest and then the first hunger strike failed to produce the dividend which they were after, namely political status. Uh, so they said, well, we'll go in and bat again and see if we can get political status through the, uh, the what Mrs. Thatcher, I think, rightly called playing the last card, which is actually getting some of their lads to die. On March the 1st, Sand stopped taking food and medical treatment followed by Francis Hughes, then by Raymond McCreesh and Patsy O'Hara. The effect in the Catholic ghettos was just what the IRA planned. Father Des Wilson, a priest in Ballymurphy. Well, the impact here was quite dramatic. I think what the government seemed to be saying was that uh, if this is allowed to go on, then, of course, people will... will uh, uh, first of all, the military campaign of the Republicans would be defused and the people will fade away. But, in fact, the military uh, campaign was not defused and, it, and indeed... Uh, the Republican movement got a tremendous boost and a tremendous boost in organisation and, and in people. The change was quite dramatic and in fact at that time, at the beginning of the hunger strikes, I believed, and I said it quite publicly, this is the beginning of the end of uh, British rule in Ireland. As moderates and churchmen joined the extremists in condemning what they called the British government's inflexibility, the IRA chalked up the first victories of its new campaign. In a masterstroke of propaganda, the dying Bobby Sands was put up to fight the Fermanagh by-election. With no Catholics opposing him, he won and then died. The H-Block campaign had its first martyr. I remember talking to Bobby Sands before it started and I said, you know, I was trying to dissuade him from going on hunger strike and he said to him, I said to him, you know, it may come that you may have to die and three or four more. And he says, I know that. But I still think from that he did expect the British government would uh, come in and, and talk before he died. Right up to the last minute, I imagine he did expect that the British government would settle. A week after Sands, Francis Hughes died. And a week after that, while two other men, Joe MacDonald and Brendan McLaughlin, replaced them, the other two hunger strikers, Raymond McCreesh and Patsy O'Hara died. The H-Block campaign organised free buses for supporters from all over Ireland to go to the funerals. It used to be only Republicans you would have seen in more, most H-Block marches. It was mostly Republicans you see. Nowadays you see everybody, you see so-called middle-class Catholics. Nothing you would never have seen out in a Republican parade. I wouldn't say it's turned me into a Republican, but um, it's turned it's turned us all very bitter. Well, I'm going to hitch block funeral you know, because I don't believe what Margaret Thatcher has done to the youth of Ireland. This boy's getting buried today; he's only in his early twenties. Patsy O'Hara interned at 17 as a suspected member of the IRA. 
For the next five years, he was in and out of court on terrorist charges. He was serving eight years for possession of a hand grenade when he died on hunger strike, aged 23. In his hometown of Derry, black flags hang from every window around his house, announcing a ritual that blurs traditional Catholic mourning with paramilitary display in an attempt to harden today's Republicans and educate tomorrow's. These rituals have become standard practice for the dead hunger strikers. Two days earlier, Father Fall had visited the home of Raymond McCreesh, the third hunger striker to die. Well, you went down there and uh, the, the boy was, body was lying in the coffin. There was a tricolor there. There was um, a lot of young girls about with black handkerchiefs over their faces, which to me is a totally abnormal thing. I mean, I, I, it's a, but that is a, a very abnormal thing at any kind of a funeral in, in, in our diocese of Armagh. Like the homes of McCreesh and Sands and Hughes before him, O'Hara's house is turned into a shrine to heighten emotion and play on Catholic reverence for the dead. His body is laid out for the neighbours to visit. The Irish National Liberation Army provide a hooded guard of honour, complete with paramilitary and religious insignia, a potent mixture to turn a convicted terrorist into a hero, propaganda within the community designed to win sympathy for a cause, propaganda aimed at a wider audience at his funeral the next day. Gunmen dominate the biggest funeral in Derry since the victims of Bloody Sunday in 1972. They knew the world's press will be there and made sure they got good pictures. Some reported a martyr's funeral, and so it was. Others saw it as one more salvo in the propaganda war, and it was that too. What the H Block men had at first claimed was a mere protest over prison conditions had mobilised support behind a familiar theme get Britain out of Ireland. People who march behind the coffins of dead volunteers or dead hunger strikers are extremely angry people and they would no doubt blame the British government for the, for the deaths. I think secondly what they've demonstrated to the IRA is that there is a potential recruitment or pool of recruits if you like uh, arising directly from the hunger strike situation. So as far as you're concerned they're fodder for the IRA? No, no, as far as you're concerned they're fodder for the IRA. As far as I'm concerned they're Irish people who support the liberation struggle. But you said they were potential recruits. Well they are potential recruits. Every Irish man and woman is a potential recruit. But there aren't many recruits in Ulster's majority community, the Protestants. They welcomed Mrs Thatcher on Friday, when she swooped unannounced on Belfast and showed that when it comes to a flair for publicity, the IRA don't have it all their own way. They seek to work on the most basic of human emotions, pity, as a means of creating tension and stoking the fires of bitterness and hatred. In doing so, the provisional IRA have put the Catholic community on the rack. And my heart goes out to all those there who are finding themselves in an increasingly intolerable position. The Prime Minister argued that even the hunger strikers themselves were manipulated by IRA commanders. It would seem that dead hunger strikers who have extinguished their own lives are of more use to the provisional IRA than living members. Such is their cold, calculated cynicism. A week before her visit, the British government's Northern Ireland office, in a propaganda exercise of its own, leaked suggestions that one of the dying hunger strikers, Raymond McCreesh, had indicated that he wanted to give up his hunger strike, but that his brother, a Catholic priest, had dissuaded him promising the dying man that Bobby Sands and Francis Hughes were waiting for him in heaven. McCreesh carried on fasting and duly died. His family deny that any such episode ever took place. But World in Action has seen extracts of a record of the conversation. Republicans say the story is an invention of what they call Britain's Dirty Tricks Department. It is impossible to find out the whole truth. Propaganda thrives on half-truth and innuendos. The government also claims to have evidence that prisoners are coerced by senior IRA commanders. Well, I think the evidence comes out perhaps rather clearly in the case of Mr McLaughlin, uh, the chap who was in one of our hospitals and who had a perforated ulcer and was bleeding to death, quite apart from whether he was fasting or not. And you probably remember the clear authorisation from the provisional Sinn Féin and the leaders of the terrorist organisation outside that he could come off it. The IRA insists that hunger strikers themselves make the decisions inside the prison. 
but admit that McLaughlin's death would have made poor propaganda. That Brenton McLaughlin would have died not as a result of a hunger strike, but as a result of a stomach or disorder. Now, that would not in any way have highlighted the plight of the prisoners. The question remains, are the hunger strikers or their families pressurised? Not surprisingly, Patsy O'Hara's mother denies it. Nobody ever said anything like that to me because the hitch block organisers and, and everybody else, even his own, even his own friends in the organisation, they were fully behind me, whatever I would have decided. In fact, not me alone, the wee boys. They would stand by the wee boys' decision, whatever. Not at all if they had a put pressure on me. I would have put pressure on them because there were plenty of television cameras all around the world here and I would have told everybody. I would have put pressure on them. They had no stage or time ever. It was Patsy that informed us. When security forces captured a rocket launcher last week and shot the IRA man carrying it, the IRA tried more propaganda. At the spot where the launcher was captured, roadblocks went up after rumours that the gunman was a passerby shot in the back by the police. The barricades are bait for the army. Behind them are petrol bombs and this time the gunman as well, but the army didn't bite. So the IRA invited photographers behind the lines to take pictures of their weapons. All part of the propaganda game. But more significant than routine displays of strength in traditional riot areas is the way the IRA message is getting through to middle-class Catholic estates. Dormit Hill is just a typical middle-class area. Well, it was quiet. Nobody ever bothered. Before the hunger strike, even up to last week, the British soldiers talked to the children and let them play with their guns, you know. Babies would have said, can I see your gun? But, but now, from last Thursday, they... I'll say they just won't be tolerated anymore. And that's because of the deaths of the hunger strike? Because of the four deaths. The first two didn't really sink into the people here, but the second two did. Yes, I'd say that and even the last one clinched it. Yeah. When Patsy O'Hara died, that was it, wasn't it? Yeah. Local elections two weeks ago carried the same message. Out of 70 candidates supporting political status, 35 were elected. The moderate Catholic SDLP held its ground only by supporting prison reforms for the IRA men. And even then it was outflanked in some areas by out-and-out -out supporters of the prisoners' demands. Catholic candidates who dared oppose political status were trounced. Jerry Fitt, MP for West Belfast, lost his city council seat. People who were have now been elected to propagate the IRA words, and let me say this quite very clearly, and with all the seriousness I can command, some of those people who were elected at last week's elections are not very far away from the gunmen. I wouldn't like to be in the Belfast City Council with them. They're not very far away from the gunmen. The votes took place in a mood of hysteria, and the Catholic population is, whether it likes it or not, uh, in, in the mind of a Protestant in support of the IRA. In that situation, it is a very, very dangerous situation. Right, gentlemen. Right, gentlemen. Can you close the ranks up? For their part, the Protestants are lining up behind their own extremists. Paisleyites more than doubled their number of council seats at the expense of more moderate Protestant parties. Paisley has his own publicity machine, and its message is simple. Only Ian Paisley can be trusted to resist the IRA's demands. We all know that the British government at the last hunger strike, no matter how they denied it, gave in 80% to the hunger strikers' claims. Mr Atkins got up in the House of Commons and said he had given in nothing. Now he admits, now the IRA admit, now everyone admits that they gave 80%. And the pressure is on him now to give the 20%. What stopped him giving that final 20%? The Protestant people. Propaganda again. The fact is that four of the prisoners' demands were met by the government's relaxation of rules for all prisoners in Northern Ireland jails. So on the principle of giving special status for terrorist offences, the government gave nothing. But with Ulster in turmoil, the Republican propagandists have another publicity stunt up their sleeves. This week, they turn their sights on the south. Preparing the ground, Bernadette McCallisky. Former Westminster MP Bernadette Devlin. For the weak points, the pressure points, where we can break the intransigence of the British government. 
the weakest point lies not here in the north. It lies in the south. It lies with Charles Hawley, presently Taoiseach, of these 26 counties, who claims to be the leader of the Irish people. He is the person who owns the keys, because it is he and his government who now face and stand for re-election. It is he and the government of the south of, I of Ireland who patrol the southern side of a border that was none of the making of the Irish people. Letter Kenny in the Southern Ireland County of Donegal prepares to welcome Irish Prime Minister Charles Hockey, flying in to campaign for next week's general election. Hockey's dilemma is simple. He needs hardline Republican votes if his government is to stay in office, but he can't afford to alienate Mrs Thatcher if their cautious attempt at an Anglo-Irish initiative is to stay alive. The hunger strike campaign has brought his dilemma to a head. I would say that uh, the hitch block situation and the deaths and all that has followed from that has, if anything, uh, persuaded more and more people in the South of the need for a political solution. They, they see the uh, situation there as becoming increasingly unacceptable and intolerable, uh, and they would, I believe, very much wish for and wholeheartedly support political initiatives now which would bring forward a solution to the problem. In the election campaign, Mr Hockey is under pressure from hunger strikers' supporters. They plan to repeat Bobby Sands for manor victory on a grand scale. Backed by demonstrations against Hockey's election convoy, they've picked nine constituencies where Republican sympathies are strong and put up May's prisoners as candidates, including the men who took over as hunger strikers when the first four died. Their intervention could cost Hockey the election and bury the Anglo-Irish initiative, which the IRA sees as a sellout. And if any of the nine win, Southern Irish MPs may soon be starving to death in a British jail, putting still more pressure on the British government. Would the government become more flexible if more prisoners join the strike? Northern Ireland Office Minister Michael Allison. No, certainly not, no. Uh, 2,000 is the figure we have to play with. These are 2,000 innocent folk. Some of them are terrorists, admittedly, so not so innocent, but 2,000 people have been done to death in the course of a a, a, a programme and a campaign of violence in the province and our policy is to show that violence does not pay. But is the British message getting through? We asked Mr Allison who he thought was winning the H-Block propaganda war. Now that's a, a, a very difficult question to answer, I think objectively. One can only generalise and one can only give one's own impression but it's very subjective. Uh, I would judge that the world opinion insofar as it's summed up by the press and the media readily understand what the British government is facing and trying to do. The leader writers in most of the North American papers, for example, clearly understand, I think particularly against the background of the assassination attempt on President Reagan, more recently the attempt on the life of the Pope, that civil governments in free Western democracies have got to stand up to violent terrorism, which is what we're doing. I can honestly say, in all the years that I have lived in Northern Ireland, the hunger strike and the deaths and everything attaching to it, the propaganda war, which has been won hands down by the IRA. The IRA were absolutely delighted. They couldn't have made provision for it. They didn't realise it was going to be a tremendous success. But it has had a fearful impact on the Catholic community. When the European Human Rights Commission ruled against political status for the H-Block prisoners, it also criticised the British government's inflexibility. This, and the continuing military deadlock, has provided fertile ground for the IRA's propagandists. Their victory list is impressive, renewed support in the Catholic community, the sympathy of much of the world's press, new promises today of a policy rethink by the British Labour Party, and an intervention in the South's general election next week, which could radically transform Anglo-Irish relations. If the hunger strike campaign is the IRA's last card, the British government has yet to show that it holds a card which can trump it. <laughs>